Welcome to Bloomington, Indiana. Like many large college towns, this town has a fantastic restaurant scene. Here's a story about restaurants that you might have heard before. The modern concept of the restaurant was born in Paris around the turn of the 19th century, the Revolution. Cooks who had previously been employed in the kitchens of great aristocratic households, well, they suddenly found themselves out of work when said great houses lost their heads. Insert guillotine sound effect. In the sudden absence of any more princes to serve, these incredibly skilled cooks created a whole new industry, serving instead the general public out of a storefront instead of a private kitchen. In the Western world, at least, that is the origin story of the restaurant. And serious works of scholarship repeat that story all the time. Is it true? Kinda not really, says Dr. Rebecca Spang, professor of history here at Indiana University. Specializing in the history of 18th and 19th century France, and I wrote a book called The Invention of the Restaurant. In a new and updated edition, in bookstores now and linked in the description. So there are a number of problems with that old story about the birth of restaurants. The first being that the first recorded restaurants were not in France. The first known restaurants weren't even in Europe. They were in Asia, specifically present-day China, Song Dynasty. Like half a millennium before restaurants showed up in Paris, they had them in China. I mean, they didn't call them restaurants because restaurant is a French word, but they were restaurants. In um, what we would call the 12th and 13th century, um, a very vibrant urban culture with hundreds of thousands, I mean, the biggest cities in the world at that point were in that part of the world, um, and writers from that culture describe menus of endless length um, and great sophistication. And menus are one defining feature of true restaurants. Neither the Chinese nor the French invented selling prepared foods to other people. Despite the fact that both the Chinese and the French have a tendency to claim they invented just about everything. No, civilizations all over the world have ancient traditions of cooking food and then selling it or otherwise distributing it outside the home. I mean, the great majority of people in the course of human history didn't have their own kitchens, didn't have dining rooms. Uh, so either people were, you know, peasants eating what they had, perhaps cooked in the single room they had, or more likely, if you're thinking about an urban setting, uh, people did have to eat from street vendors, from taverns. Indeed, the modern food truck is simply the latest incarnation of a truly ancient business concept, street hawking. And yeah, modern food trucks have menus because they've been heavily influenced by the restaurant industry, but historically speaking, that probably wasn't the norm. It was more like, here's some food I cooked. Do you want to buy some? Yes or no? Those were the two choices on the menu. Yes food, no food. Dr. Spang says it's a similar story if you look at the history of other pre-restaurant eating establishments. Imagine you're a traveler. I'm traveling right now. I'm visiting Bloomington, Indiana, because I used to live here a long time ago, and I get back to visit every now and then. Really like it here. Anyway, imagine you're a traveler in a historical context. There's no hotels for you to stop at when it gets dark at night. So what do you do instead? Well, you try to keep to heavily trafficked paths and you might come across a house that has some extra rooms in it. And if you've got a little bit of coin in your pocket, you could rent one of those rooms for the night and get yourself a meal. You would have sat down at an inn with everybody else who was staying in the inn. And all the food would have been put on the table at once. And it would have been what we today would call family style. There's no menu. It's whatever the innkeeper cooked that night. You can either eat it or not. Same deal with drinking establishments, which urban areas all over the world have had since forever. Taverns, pubs. Historically, such places might have also offered some food, but not a menu. There's one joint of mutton in the corner. You can either have some with your ale or not. That isn't a restaurant, even though modern pubs like the Irish Lion here in Bloomington have basically evolved into sit-down restaurants with vestigial bars attached to them. Same deal with tea houses, coffee houses, very old institutions, but not restaurants, at least not originally. Le Petit Café in Bloomington is run by this adorable old French couple who settled here decades ago, and despite the name, it's a restaurant, not a café. Historically, in France, a café is a coffee house. A restaurant is a place where you sit down and order a meal, you get a choice, and then you get up and you leave. 
all right? Where a cafe, you can hang around, you drink your coffee, maybe you drink something else, um, but the emphasis is not on the food, um, right? They might serve food, but the point of going there isn't for the food. Even though lots of cafes today have restaurantified and become all about the food. We'll talk about the origins of true restaurants in a moment, but if you're all about the coffee, consider patronizing the sponsor of this video, Trade Coffee. I think one reason I hated coffee as a much younger man is that most of the ostensible coffee houses in my world were just sandwich shops that also made bad coffee. And most coffee I got at home was bad because most coffee at the grocery store was stale. Not so now when I buy from Trade Coffee. I take their quiz online, I tell them what I like, and they connect me with a roaster who sends me something super fresh straight to my door. Not some global commodity blend, but in this case, beans from a place in Guatemala where they do the so-called natural process of drying the beans when they're still inside their fruits, which gives them this crazy complex fruity flavor I just love. Totally different from conventional wet processed coffee, but whatever you like, Trade can connect you with a roaster today who will send you something uncommonly fresh and great. And then Trade will send you more so you get a variety and you never run out. Cancel shipments or change the frequency anytime. Right now, Trade is offering a total of $20 off your first three bags when you go to drinktrade.com slash ragusia. That's more than 16 cups of coffee for free with my link in the description. $20 off. Thank you, Trade. Anyway, historically speaking, inns are not restaurants, cafes are not restaurants, pubs are not restaurants, bistros are not restaurants. Bistros were boarding houses in Paris where you could rent a room and also get your meals for your rent. So what exactly are restaurants, according to Dr. Spang? The great innovation of the first restaurateurs is both in their menu, but in how they serve it. So there are separate tables for different parties, right, on the model really of a cafe, which is an institution for the earlier part of the 18th century. Separate tables, printed menus, so you can pick what you want, and they serve pretty much at any hour. Right, meaning it's not a situation like at the inn where dinner is whenever the innkeeper gets dinner ready. If you miss it, you miss it. At a restaurant, like the excellent farm here in Bloomington, you show up within a reasonable window of time, they sit you and your party at your own little table away from everybody else, they give you a menu with tons of options on it. You pick a few, and then they cook or at least finish those dishes to order just for you. And they deliver them to your table like you're king for a day. That is a restaurant. And they had establishments meeting this basic definition like 800 years ago in Song Dynasty China. But then there's this whole thing where Song Dynasty fell and China kind of de-urbanized, arguably de-modernized for a while. Between that and the eventual European colonialism, a lot of modern restaurant culture in East Asia is a hybrid of Eastern and Western tradition. And the Western tradition developed independently in France, in Paris, in its own surprisingly weird way. Dr. Spang says it started before the revolution in France. Think about the word restaurant. Where does that word come from? In French, it comes from the verb se restaurer, which means to restore, to refresh. So the first restaurants, or really they were called the first restorers rooms, are opened in the 1760s and then in the 1770s in Paris to serve restorative dishes. Specifically, restorative bouillon, bone broth. Just as bone broth has been a health craze in recent years, so it was in pre-revolutionary France, along with some other trendy health foods the first restaurants also served. Um, rice puddings, water from the king's well, uh, wine with special designations, all of those things that in the 1760s, 70s would have been very, very special indeed. And the establishments that served these trendy, expensive, therapeutic edibles operated a little bit more like health spas. Health spas have an ancient tradition of highly personalized, individualized service. Oh, come this way, Monsieur. I can see you're so tired and weary. Come over to this quiet table where you can be by yourself and rest. Here is a list of all of the therapies we offer. A person of your refined taste would certainly want to pick something specific, right? They're selling restorative bouillon specifically to those um, delicate, urban individuals 
who didn't feel inclined uh, to eat a big heavy meal. The first restaurateurs advertise specifically that they cater to those who are not in the habit of eating an evening meal. So anybody, right, so you, the first restaurants are places where you go out not to eat, but to delicately sip your bouillon. Now, why would you do that? Like, if you don't feel like eating, why do you go to a restaurant? You go to show to your friends, to the people at the other tables, that you are so sophisticated, so um, sensitive, would have been the 18th century word, that you can't really tolerate the sort of heavy meals that other people are eating. Right? So it's a sign of social distinction, social sophistication. What happens in the course of the French Revolution is that that kind of marking of social distinction is no longer what we in the 20th or 21st century would call politically correct. So the restaurateurs have to change things up. And instead of saying that they cater only to the finest people, to those with delicate appetites, instead they say, ah, we make all dishes available to all honest Frenchmen. Um, so it's a complete inversion of the kind of audience to which they were trying to appeal. So yeah, that's the true and much weirder origin story of the Western restaurant industry, according to Dr. Spang's research. The innovation that really stuck wasn't what they served at the first restaurants, but rather how they served it. Individual tables, show up when you want, get a menu, choose from many options, have it prepared to order, pay your bill and get out. Is there any truth at all to the old story about private cooks losing their jobs when their masters got the chop and then all they could do was turn around and sell chops to the mob who'd done the chopping? There were a few very famous individuals who had been um, chefs, not in manners, um, but again, in uh, princely households in Paris, who left those households, um, went into the public food trades, and wrote cookbooks. So the famous one is somebody called Beauvillier. Um, but he actually had left the royal household already in the 1780s. So he's not pushed out of his work because of the French Revolution. Um, you could say that he's just part of this commercialization um, of food culture that happens in the course of the 18th century. And that commercialization happens in part due to the revolution, also in part due to some of the factors that led to the revolution, one of those being the rise of the urban middle class, the bourgeoisie, who didn't understand why the hereditary nobility and royalty should have all the fun. There's a reason we still refer to people who like the finer things and who are capable of paying for them as being bougie. I suppose I'm pretty bougie at this point, I should acknowledge. bougie went on the decline in France immediately after the Revolution. It became quite unfashionable and indeed dangerous to flaunt one's wealth. And then this short guy named Boney came to power and got into a war against basically all of Europe. And if you had money or food, you wanted to be seen shoveling it to the army, not in your own face. There's a period of about a year in 1803 when the Treaty of Amiens uh, creates a short-lived peace across Europe. This is the time when British travelers flock to France to see what the revolution has changed. And this is when they start writing and say, oh my gosh, you'll never believe it. They have these establishments called restaurants. I guess they must have been created by the revolution. Not having paid attention to the servers of restorative bouillons who'd been there since the 1760s and the 1770s. But the Brits loved the restaurant concept, and they absorbed it, and then the Brits and the French exported that concept all over the world via their respective massive empires. And back home, within France, all kinds of other older eating establishments kind of morphed into restaurants. Establishments that, in an earlier vocabulary, would have been called mm, estaminé, or traiteur, all start adding the word restaurant because that becomes the familiar word. And that, of course, is the word that foreigners know. Um, so they take the word and then sometimes they take the, the, 
the style of service as well. And all of that explains why basically every place in the world now has restaurants. And people in those places have turned around and exported their versions of the restaurant concept as far away as Bloomington, Indiana. Your table is ready. Right this way, Monsieur. 